morning. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Welcome um, to this session. I think this is probably the session that has the vastest name in all in our conference, you know, like it's a big name, as vast as the rainforest of this world. So we're going to talk about rainforest today. And I have my wonderful colleagues here, Jerry and Lily. Hope we have a lot of questions and a good dialogue. Um, I'm Gustavo, Gustavo Faleros, editor at the Pulitzer Center. I run at the Pulitzer Center an initiative that's called the Rainforest Investigations Network. I will introduce Jerry and Lily to you. But I, I want to mention that there are two fellows of, the, of this network, the Rainforest Investigations Network. And I'm very grateful to IMAT who has uh, given this opportunity to us to introduce this network, but the work that we've been doing on investigating um, rainforests. And why investigating rainforests is so important. This network that I mentioned to you has three years. And we've been investigating the Amazon region, the Congo Basin, and the forests of Southeast Asia. So we have um, more or less every year 10 to 12 journalists that they work as a cohort. They collaborate between them, um, exchanging data, um, uh, having training. Uh, we support them on doing their field trips. We exchange like security tips. So we work together to investigate these three regions. But why is it important to look at the specific, these three regions? I believe many of you have heard about the importance of rainforests. All the time in the news we heard like, like oh, if the rainforest, if the Amazon disappears, we all going to die. You heard this before, right? Things like this, or uh, the rainforests are key for combating climate change. Uh, all, of, all of this is true, you know, like, but if you want to do journalism about it, what are the, you know, like the key facts to prove this uh, very big statements? So this is what we, we try to do. The rainforests, of course, they are important because of the climate issue, like deforestation, which is this thing that keeps going. You know, like many times I get these questions like, why the for I'm Brazilian, by the way. Um, why deforestation keeps happening in Brazil? This is madness. Why people want to get rid of forests? So this is the question that we have to answer in this network. Why deforestation keeps happening in Brazil, um, you know, like in Bolivia, in, in Cambodia, in Vietnam. It happens and it's not necessarily growing as a whole, but it's growing in some countries, diminishing in others. But the truth is, like, deforestation still represents 10 to 50 percent of all emissions of greenhouse gases. So it is a big contribution to climate change. But carbon is just like one part of the story. Rainforest, as you know, like, is the home of the biggest biodiversity that we have in the world. So we, we need, you know, like, to understand better forms of life that live there. Um, and also, and here is the, 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 the key thing for us to discuss. They are key for the economy of the world. Many of the products that we consume today, they are more and more based on exploring what is in the rainforest. So I can mention a few things. I'm certain that the meat and the pork that we eat here in Greece are in great part supported by the soybeans that are exported from the Amazon in Brazil to Europe. That's one part of the thing that I can tell you. I'm pretty sure that all of you have mobiles in your phones with a little bit of gold and other minerals that are taken from the Amazon and from the Congo Basin. I'm pretty sure as well, like some of you have some clothes produced in Cambodia that are, um, you know, like produced with few based on burning forests from Cambodia, which Jerry is going to show to us. Maybe you have, some of you want to keep your beauty and consuming collagen which is produced also with bovine explored in the Amazon, as Lily will show. So everything is connected, using a, a bit of a cliche here. And what we do in this network is finding these connections. And the only way of doing this is looking at supply chains. And as some of you might be investigative journalists, you might know that looking at supply chains is very complex because you have like the financial aspects, there's money that is pouring into the supply chains. You have big companies like that sometimes are acting in exactly these three rainforest regions. We have mining companies that have operations in Indonesia, Brazil, and Congo. Look at that, you know. Um, and then you have all the kind of impacts. I'm talking about environment a lot, but you have to remember as well that the rainforests are the home 
of the less, you know, like isolated people of this world. Isolated in a sense, indigenous tribe that decided to not have contact with our civilization. So I often find that people are fascinated when they see a picture of an indigenous people trying to attack an helicopter with a bow and arrow. It shows like that in the world that we are all connected here, life to the world, there's people still that doesn't want to connect with our civilization. In this moment of climate crisis, as we say, are they maybe the answer for our, you know, like our crisis? That's the key thing of linking also the rainforest with the human rights aspect. Many of these stories that you're going to see show that while exploring the natural resources, we are basically, we are saying like the supply chain is killing people because we invite inv invading like indigenous land. We are pressuring people to be displaced from their homes. So it's a very complex issue that deserves a global audience and a global attention. So I talked too much already. I'll introduce my, my colleagues. We'll start with a presentation from Lily. Lily is Brazilian like me. She's been uh, working with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London. She's a, a very experienced journalist, have worked with the Globe and Mail in Canada, with the Dow Jones, covering economic issues, but now she's dedicating to uh, climate and environmental reporting. So, Lily will um, talk uh, about the collagen and the beef supply chain. Welcome, Lily. Um, good morning. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such an honor to be here, honestly. Um, yeah, so thank you, Gustavo, for the introduction. Um, I, I, I am the one with the red T-shirt in the picture. Um, uh, as Gustavo said, I work for the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Uh, now that I see this big screen, I regret some of my decisions of uh, making dead jokes in my slides. Um, but I work for the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, and if you guys don't know the Bureau, basically we are a newsroom uh, based in London. Uh, we work with public interest journalism, and I'm part of the environment team. And uh, my, I have a very specific focus. So our team looks into the environmental impact of global food production, basically. So it's very niche, but as Gustavo say, uh, says, uh, it's important because it's about supply chains, and supply chains um, are what connects uh, several different parts of the world, and often uh, it's what drives environmental destruction and. Um, human rights abuses somewhere else. So I'm going to talk about collagen um, because this is the, one of the latest investigations that my team worked on. And as I said, I work uh, investigating food supply chains. And often my friends accuse me of ruining their food um, because I, I map supply chains and I show uh, that there's a lot going on when it comes to environmental destruction. So this time, I investigated uh, the collagen supplements, and we focused on a, one of the biggest brands, uh, Vital Proteins, is a brand owned by Nestle and advertised by um, Jennifer Aniston. She is the, you know, the face of this brand. So yeah, I, I put Jennifer Aniston and the Amazon in the same sentence, and it kind of makes sense, um, but I will show how, I will show why. Um, so we produced a, a video, which is uh, something that we're trying to do differently this time, because honestly, the investigations that we work on are very complex. Uh, this investigation took my team 10 months, um, so very painful. Uh, also, it's difficult to put all this evidence together in a way that people actually care. Um, my family, my family doesn't, they don't even read my stories, honestly, it's, they are very boring. Um, but they will, you know, watch a one, one and a half minute video explaining what's going on with collagen. So collagen is this wellness beauty product advertised by celebrities like Jennifer Aniston or digital influencers. It's everywhere, basically. You guys can buy, don't buy, seriously, it's joking. Um, you guys can buy in the US, in Europe, uh, in Brazil, where I'm, where I'm from. Um, so it's, it's everywhere, and you see, you see ads all the time and social media. So we decided to try something different to make sure that people actually, you know, paid attention to the investigation, and we produced this video, which kind of tries to um, show this investigation through the, you know, this 
influencer type of video um, to make people actually care about it. I, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to play. And uh, let's see what you guys think. Collagen, collagen, collagen. The wonder product for skin, joints, and muscles. It might be good for your health, but what about the health of the planet? Like others, best-selling collagen brand Vital Protein sources grass-fed, pasture-raised bovine hide from Brazil. That means cow skins, by the way. Cows that eat grass. Their chief creative officer swears by it. But grass-fed doesn't mean sustainable, especially when talking about Brazil. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism dug into this murky industry and found vast deforestation and invasion of indigenous lands. Here comes the complex bit. Concentrate. Across Brazil, many indigenous people live in tropical forests and preserve these lush environments. But their land is under threat from farmers invading to deforest and raise cattle, cows that eat grass. These cows get mixed up with ones from legit farms and sold to nearby abattoirs, many of which are owned by Brazil's biggest and controversial beef companies, JBS, Marfrig, and Minerva. Dead cow skins go to tanneries to de-hair and de-flesh, and then to collagen companies to turn into scoopable powder. But isn't it just a byproduct, you say? No, it's a big part of meat companies' income. So while being healthy is vital, so is the health of the planet. Yeah, this is the company's response um, to the investigation. We have to put it there. It's mandatory. All right, so I'm going to try and walk you guys through this complex and painful process of mapping a whole supply chain that nobody has ever mapped before. Um, so if the, I, I divided into three steps. Uh, step one was research data analysis a little bit of pain, sweat, and tears in my team um, because there was no data. Uh, so we had to kind of create it ourselves and we had to combine different efforts to make sure that we got some information to start with. So just to, important, important to mention that you know, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism has a lot of experience um, covering and investigating food supply chains, especially beef, uh, and soy, so the, the beef industry, the impact that the beef industry generates has been fairly well documented, but collagen was something that was completely new. And we were already investigating Nestle for um, another story, uh, a beef story, so we found that Nestle was buying um, beef from cattle raised illegally inside indigenous territories, so, and we bumped into um, some evidence that pointed us to collagen. So basically shipping records, uh, we were looking into it and we found vast amounts of collagen being um, exported out of Brazil. So this is why we got interested. So we started with data scraping um, of the meat packers' websites. I got some leaked documents showing the, the transport records. We looked into shipping records as well. And then we started cross-referencing everything. So we looked into satellite imagery uh, with deforestation data. We uh, also partnered with a research um, organization called uh, Center for Climate Crisis Analysis, uh, CCCA. So they helped us understand a little bit more what's the size of the damage. So how much deforestation are we talking about? Um, so after looking into all that, we, we conducted several interviews with people that knew a little bit more about this than us. Um, and then we started trying to beef up the, the evidence. Um, apologies for the pun, I could not avoid it. Um, so we understood that we didn't know anything and we didn't know the players, we didn't know the companies involved. So we um, started you know, digging deeper and trying to understand who is supplying Nestle? Okay, but who is supplying the supplier that supplies Nestle? And who comes before that? So we, it was a lot of work to understand what's the, what's the journey between one farm to another farm to another farm, slaughterhouse, then it goes to a tannery, um, and then the collagen factory, it's a gelatin and collagen factory, and then it's exported to international markets until it gets to the shelves of Walmart, um, Amazon, uh, Holland and Barrett in the UK, so basically everywhere. So it was a lot of work to map this supply chain because this, um, this hasn't been done before. But we bumped, uh, well, we, we hit the wall, basically. Uh, we 
had some fairly good idea of what was going on, but we could not confirm um, because the data was not telling enough, the experts, they were not helping us enough. So we understood that we needed to combine all those tools and data scraping and all those you know, fancy techniques that we used with, with our desk reporting through some very old school underground reporting. Um, so this, by the way, is a truck. This is a truck carrying um, cow skins um, from the slaughterhouse to the to the um, collagen and gelatin factory to be processed. So we went on three reporting trips uh, to Brazil to try and confirm all these links that we thought existed. Um, this is um, one of the one of the trips um, in Pará in Brazil. Um, and then we visited the slaughterhouses, the tanneries, uh, the farms. We tried to also visit uh, some indigenous people who were um, being affected by uh, the, you know, this, this, this whole supply chain. So they, we tried to understand what kind of impact uh, this operation had to people's lives uh, on the ground. And then we confirmed, we confirmed the links. We confirmed um, what we thought it was true just by, you know, old school reporting, talking to truck drivers, um, talking to people, local experts, um, so we could understand that we were on the right track. And the result was really good because we prepared a plan. Um, we had a five-day strategy uh, for our delivery. Uh, so we partnered with The Guardian uh, in the UK. ITV is the second biggest broadcaster in the UK. Um, and this is a cross-border investigation, so we also partnered uh, with outlets in Brazil. O Joio Trigo is an investigative outlet in Brazil. UOL is um, the biggest um, news website in the country. So it got a lot, of, um, a, lot, a lot of coverage everywhere. So it got picked up by very important uh, news outlets around the world. So it was good. But we also had a social media strategy, which included the TikTok video, uh, we had also an explainer because honestly, I I didn't know anything about collagen before I started working on this investigation. I never paid attention to it, um, and so so we assumed that nobody else was paying attention to it. So either sorry, and then we created this explainer um, video explainer with that. So we 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 were really you know doing our best to try and make sure that the story had impact and had enough reach. And one other, one other thing that it's really important for us at the Bureau, so we are impact driven and we don't sit, we, we don't sit and wait uh, that the impact will come. So we, we always have a plan and a strategy to make sure that the story lives on after publication. And we got already some nice results. Um, so right after publication, um, we, we saw some of the retailers putting a lot of pressure on Nestle and Vital Proteins uh, to make sure that they clean up their supply chain. Uh, for the first time, of course, we put collagen on the deforestation map. So until, until, until then, um, collagen was not something that people would automatically link to, to Amazon deforestation. So that was an interesting um, result. And, but most importantly, um, um, one of the, in one of the responses that Nestle sent to their clients that was leaked to us, um, Nestle Vital Proteins was saying that, was making the promise that they would stop source from the Amazon region effective immediately. So there's, um, we, we, we are proud that we could spark some change. So that's one of the things that um, we, are, we are proudest about. Um, they will probably hate me for adding all these pictures. Um, sorry, guys, but I just want to say that, you know, I'm just representing my team. We don't do this alone. We don't do this, you know, the, the lone wolf, meeting people in parking lots, you know, investigative journalists being mysterious. This doesn't happen anymore. We need teams. We need people working together and collaborating. Um, and this is why I just want to leave this message because we are, when we talk about supply chains, local is global, global is local. So it's important that we connect the dots and we show that companies need to be held accountable, govern, govern, governments need to be held accountable for you know, what they do and what, or what they don't do. And the best way to do it is teaming up with people that you know, can help you and, and have different skill sets and can help you, um, you know, move further and accomplish more, more things, right? 
Um, yeah, so let's, let's collaborate. And thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Lily. Thank you so much. As you can see, a lot of interesting elements in, in Lily's presentation, not to speak about the collaboration, but you know, like working with different expertise, the partnership she did with, um, um, with some of the uh, researchers on the way. So there's a lot of things for us to think and, and, and question. Um, one of the things that I'll pass it on to Jerry very soon is uh, that we notice in this network that it's very important to have this three elements for doing something like very deep and impactful is like having the data aspect, as you could see Lily was using a lot of data, having then a very good opportunity to be in the field, interviewing the people and knowing, and finally the collaboration. So it, it is a model for us, which I think can be reproduced in any kind of environment. If you have these three elements, really data analysis, rigorous data analysis with a good opportunity to be in the field, interviewing the people, and then collaborate with other people, you can get a, a good investigation. But let me ask um, Jerry Flynn to be uh, with us. Uh, Jerry is a, a journalist working for Mongabe in Cambodia. Um, he's been there four years in Cambodia, right, Jerry? Before working as a journalist in Vietnam for two years, uh, has published with several um, publications as well, but most recently being dedicated to cover environmental issues for Mongabe. So, Jerry. All right, here we go. Good morning. Yes, it is. Um, thank you uh, for having me here in this incredibly stylish, fashionable city. Um, unfortunately, I'm here to tell you about why that fashion might actually be linked to illegal logging in Cambodia. So I'm here to ruin your fun, sorry. Um, but yeah, a quick introduction to myself. Um, I'm Gerald Flynn, but you can call me Jerry. Uh, I only get called Gerald if I'm in trouble. Um, but yeah, I've been in Cambodia for four and a half years now. Um, and Cambodia is not an easy place to do this job, as you might be able to imagine. Um, as you can see here, this is me swimming across to a military-controlled island where we wanted to verify that the military were actually on the island. And, uh, our boat driver was like, no, I'm not going to get shot. We're stopping the boat here, so you just gotta do what you gotta do in Cambodia, you know? Um, so yeah, um, also I'd take this opportunity to uh, say thank you to all of the very brave uh, reporters that I've worked with in Cambodia, um, many of who do not have their names on the bylines out of their choice because they have family and they don't want anything to happen to them. Again, it's Cambodia. Um, so yeah, uh, we decided to look at Cambodia's garment sector. This was one of the investigations that I was lucky enough to be able to do working with uh, the Rainforest Investigations Network. Um, so yeah, one, one of the key reasons that we chose the garment sector is because this is a $12.6 billion industry in Cambodia. Uh, before COVID, it was a $2.5 trillion industry globally. So you'd think these guys have the resources to ensure that they're not involved in anything dodgy. They do, they just don't care. So, uh, quickly, a bit of context uh, for Cambodia. So you've got roughly 750,000 uh, Cambodians employed in the garment sector, which in a country of 17 million is pretty significant. Uh, and also, notably, as you can see in this picture, taken by uh, my good colleague, Andy Ball. Uh, most of them are women. And so the social issues associated with the garment sector in Cambodia, they're pretty well documented. Um, from union busting, wage theft, um, the trucks that they're trans traveling into work, they frequently tip over, maim, kill, disfigure people for life. Um, the factories themselves often aren't built for human habitation. Um, so during Cambodia's dry season, it gets incredibly hot and there are mass faintings. Uh, during the wet season, they flood and people get electrocuted because Cambodian electric electricity. Uh, so, but the environmental 
impact of this industry is a little less known. Uh, so we actually partnered with some academics at uh, Royal Holloway at the University of London. So these guys had actually attempted to try and map out and quantify the environmental impact of Cambodia's garment sector. And so they reached out to 255 factories. Um, only 160 responded. And out of that, 48 uh, confirmed that they were burning forest wood. What's forest wood got to do with clothes? The clothes that you buy, before they get to the shops, they need to be washed, steamed, ironed, dyed. And this takes a lot of water. And in Cambodia, electricity prices are bizarrely high, uh, especially compared to the region. And so a lot of the factory owners saving money, they just use wood, burning wood to boil water. And that's how you end up with images like this, um, which makes it a little bit easier to find out who's burning wood. But um, so effectively, the researchers at Royal Holloway, Laurie Parsons is the lead researcher. Very grateful to that guy. Um, he shared with us his data uh, from 2021. Uh, and they, they had calculated that each factory in Cambodia that was burning wood was burning about 562 tons a day. Um, so this is not an insignificant amount of forest that is vanishing into garment factories. Um, and what we did that Laurie hadn't done was actually start to map out where these factories were. And so, because I've not made this map particularly well, somewhere over here would be the Cardamom Mountains. And uh, this was kind of the area that all of our investigations for the year were focused on. It's uh, an intensely beautiful piece of rainforest on the Thai border, um, particularly significant ecologically and under threat from a range of different factors that we tried to document over the course of last year. But anyway, one of the key things we noticed when we mapped out the data was that a lot of the forest wood burning factories were along this main road linking Phnom Penh, the capital, to the Cardamom Mountains. So that sort of gave us a little bit of a lead. Um, what we then started to do was look into the potential sustainable supply of wood. Now, I'm, I'm saying sustainable in inverted commas here because uh, a lot of that sustainable wood comes from what are known in Cambodia as economic land concessions. So you can see here in red, these are huge parcels of land given out to often politically connected wealthy individuals, um, often for the purpose on paper of agribusiness, plantations. Uh, but in reality, what usually happens is they get uh, 10,000 hectares of forested land, gut the forest, and then run off. So they just sell the timber, basically. Uh, and over the course of uh, Cambodia's history with economic land concessions, something like 700,000 Cambodians have been forcibly evicted from their homes. 2.2 uh, million hectares of Cambodia, again, it's a small country, uh, have been awarded in economic land concessions. And about 1.1 million of that is rubber. And the rubber wood is what a lot of the factories claim is their sustainable supply of wood. However, that a number of studies have shown that the domestic supply of rubber wood simply does not match the various demands in Cambodia. Plus, a lot of it gets sold to Vietnam because it's a much bigger market. You can make much more money selling it there. So, this led us to start thinking about, well, how, how do we kind of quantify the damage that the garment sector is doing? And one, the first thing we did was honestly quite naive. Um, Cambodia has 
as you can see here, quite a uniquely high rate of deforestation. Um, and that's for a range of reasons, not just the garment sector. I mean, the, the Khmer Rouge bankrolled themselves on the illicit timber trade. The current crop of politicians have largely done the same. So it's not the garment sector alone, but the garment sector definitely has a role to play. So we naively reached out to the 48 factories identified in the 2021 study, and then we reached out to 881 factories with TAFTAC, the industry association. They represent all of the factories that are exporting. So out of the 1,200 factories in Cambodia, 881, that's roughly how many are actually exporting goods internationally. Um, nobody wanted to talk, literally. Uh, we got two replies out of these huge email blasts, and they both just told us to go away. So that didn't work. Um, so then we got the idea, OK, we'd been lucky before using satellite imagery. Maybe we can use that and try and find, see which factories have wood. And for a long time, a lot of these factories were not storing the wood that they were using for fuel inside. But some of them kind of realized that if you leave wood outside, it gets wet. And burning it then becomes harder. So we very quickly realized that while scouring through this list of 881 factories and looking at the satellite imagery, we, we weren't really getting a lot of interest. We weren't getting any interesting results. And so then we thought, OK, what if we wait outside the factories? There are factories all around Phnom Penh um, that we know from the 2021 study have at some point been involved in the, uh, the illicit timber trade. So we spent a lot of nights uh, sat in a car with tinted up windows outside factories waiting to see if a timber delivery was going to arrive. This also didn't work. Uh, we, we ran into a lot of walls head first. Um, so we decided to reverse it. You know, instead of tracking the, for the, the wood from the factory back to the forest, we just went to the forest. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the Cardamoms National Park and Phnom Aral Wildlife Sanctuary. These were the uh, two key uh, fo protected forests that we wanted to look at. And here, the village of Kateh, that is where we went to find some loggers. And they were kind enough to take us out um, into the jungle with them, even though what they were doing is definitely a crime, 100% illegal under Cambodian law. They were, they were quite open about it because for them it's also a pretty miserable existence. None of them want to do this job, but the factories pay for the fuel, and this is the only fuel supply available, and so it becomes the only work available. Um, so this, we then had to do quite a lot of driving around. So this was some ill-advised decisions on motorbikes, driving after timber trucks around Cambodia, often at night. Um, we had one slightly high-speed chase, but uh, I won't go into that because I think my parents are listening. Um, but we basically, through this, we were able to map out uh, the entire supply chain. Uh, so you have, at the very bottom end, the loggers. These guys, they get up about 5 a.m., they make roughly four trips a day into the jungle. They risk being arrested. They risk trees falling on them. These uh, vehicles, uh, koyuns, there's not really a good English translation for that, I'm afraid. Uh, they, they have a tendency to kind of tip over and kill people quite frequently. Um, so yeah, they make about $20 per trip. Now, after that, they sell to traders. The traders are particularly interesting because they actually all came from the next village along. And they previously had been loggers, but they had just gutted all of the available forest that they could still reach and make a profit on. So they switched jobs. They became the guys ferrying the wood from deep villages deeper into this protected forest out to the cities where you have the middlemen. The middlemen are the only guys who actually have any direct connection to the factories. And they guard these relationships preciously because that is 
the cash cow. They are able to set the price for the traders and for subsequently the loggers. Um, but they make about $400 per delivery to the factories. Um, so yeah, we followed a lot of different vehicles, spoke with a lot of different people throughout this supply chain to try and understand how it works um, and to confirm that there was in fact illegally logged forest wood being burned in factories. But we wanted to understand who's driving this. You know, this, the factories aren't doing this for fun. <laughs> They're just doing it for money, obviously. But where is the money coming from? And sorry guys, it's from all of you, from us, from wanting to look kind of nice and buying clothes. And so we scraped the um, TAFTAC website, which is the, the industry association, because they, don't li they list contact details, but not in a way that makes it easy. Uh, so we built a spreadsheet off that. We then, we were very lucky that a lot of people have actually put in a lot of work already to try and uh, build transparency in the garment sector. So we were able to find out which brands were buying from uh, which factories in a lot of cases, but not in all. A lot of big brands simply don't give this information out publicly. They see zero benefit in doing so. Um, so we started reaching out to fashion brands. They didn't want to talk to us. Uh, out of the 14 international brands that we contacted, four replied, and only two actually answered our questions. So it really felt like nobody in the fashion industry wanted to talk about logging. And interestingly, nobody in the log, nobody logging wanted to go logging. Uh, a number of, out of the 15 interviews we conducted with loggers, all of them said that they were terrified of this conservation NGO called Wildlife Alliance that works with Cambodian authorities and frequently jails them, beats them, uh, confiscates their equipment, then demands bribes to have it returned. Uh, literally the first time we arrived in the village, we started doing an interview and like 20 people came out with machetes because they thought we were Wildlife Alliance. So we were like, oh shit, no, we're, we're journalists, please. Um, so yeah, nobody is having a good time there. Um, but we did get some impact, which if you know anything about Cambodia, is rare. And so we did manage to get TAFTAC, the industry association, to publicly basically admit that they had been using illegal wood uh, when they outright dismissed us at the beginning. Um, but that's it. It's words on one letter. Whether anyone's actually going to do anything about this, I don't know. But uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to shut up. Thank you, Jerry. This is wonderful. As you can see, you know, like when you do a very, sometimes some of these investigations might look very, very specific, but that's how it has to be done because it's evidence. It's pretty much like a, a research, a scientific research in a way, if you like, um, you know, and, and then you get the impact of the industry answering because you have the facts that they have to answer. That's how it's done. That's what we believe, right, on investigations. I think we'll uh, open, uh, I have my questions here. If you are not up for questions, I'll, I'll do it. But I, I want to hear from the audience and open for questions immediately. So we have one here, another one there to start. So first here on the first row and then the, the fourth, fifth row. Please identify yourself and... Calimera, bienvenida a Iglesia. Felicitaciones sobre tu presentación maravillosa. So my name is Lena. I'm really very impressed and uh, get inspired today from the three of you. Congratulations, really. You made something for the universe, for the humanity. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the most uh, difficult obstacle you have faced? And uh, what was the impact you got? And what really trains you like human being and like a journalist? Three questions to one, thank you. Lily. Um, the, the biggest impact while reporting? Um, well, we had many challenges, um, I have to confess. Um, I, think the, I think initially the, fir the first challenge was that 
we didn't know anything at all about it. So we had to literally start from scratch. And that can be, you know, that can make you feel a little bit hopeless that you're actually going to find something. Um, and maybe the second challenge was more operational because we needed to go on the ground uh, to confirm the links between the companies. We needed to also talk to the communities affected. And this, this has some risks, uh, for sure, because we were talking to truck drivers, we were following trucks, we were, you know, stalking, um, you know, um, s slaughterhouses, we were stalking um, the collagen factory. We had to, we had to you know, run away um, once when we were in one of the cities, we had to run away fast because we were being threatened by the security guards. I hope that my parents are not listening to this. Um, um, but this is, this, is, this is one of the risks, right? So when you go to these trips, um, you have to make a very good assessment on, on the risks and how to mitigate them. This is something that we have been working on, uh, both um, in, the, um, in the Pulitzer Center's Rainforest Investigations Network, but also at the Bureau. So we have to, to work on a very thorough um, assessment on how we're going to avoid the risks, and if they exist and we cannot avoid them, how we're going to mitigate them. So we have these documents uh, that we, you know, we, we plan ahead. Uh, we spend a, lo a long time planning the trips, so we make sure that the whole team is safe. Um, and I think this is one of the main challenges reporting about the Amazon these days. Um, we had last year, uh, well, one of my colleagues, uh, Don Phillips, British journalist, uh, brilliant journalist, was killed in the Amazon with Bruno Pereira, an indigenous expert. So I'll just take this opportunity to remember him. So he was reporting in the Amazon. It's a dangerous place for journalists. If you think about Brazil, you know, other Latin American countries, they are uh, deadly countries for environmental defenders and for journalists. So I think in this type of reporting that we do, definitely safety and security when you're actually on the ground is one of the biggest challenges, in my opinion. Jerry, for sure, you have a lot to share about danger. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. But um, I think for us, one of the biggest challenges was the fact that it was kind of like an open secret that the garment factories were using largely illegally sourced wood. But no one really knew where it was coming from or how it was getting there or how much money was actually being made by anyone involved. So for us, it was kind of like uh, people were quite flippant. They were like, yeah, of course, why wouldn't they? And we were like, why would they? This doesn't make sense. And so that was, that was quite a frustrating obstacle um, because, again, in Cambodia, we have a, a huge dearth of data. Uh, you know, they have an allergy to transparency. The TAFTAC, the Industry Association, literally went on the record telling us he does not want more transparency in the fashion industry. It's just bad for business. Um, so we, these were obstacles. But then obviously, yeah, like, like Lily was saying, the, uh, the physical safety elements are yeah, not to be underestimated in a place like Cambodia. Uh, we were chased. We were detained earlier this year. Um, yeah, well, we had some bad, we had some pretty bad times. Um, we're all still alive, so, you know, that's good. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation and for shedding light on the environmental aspect of it, which is heavily underreported. I just wanted to ask, even if sustainable processes are put into place, I mean, the law changes, the corporations pay the price, you will still have your local populations, the working class that are going to get lured into this type of employment because simply they have no other choice, as you said. And the same applies to illegal alluvial gold mining in Brazil. The same applies to coca plantations in Colombia. It's everywhere. What is the alternative for those people? What, is, is there hope for them? I don't know if you can answer. Well, uh, when we spoke to some Ministry of Environment rangers that are responsible for protecting these protected forests, um, we said, they said, well, yeah, of course. We know that they're illegal loggers in the village, but if we arrest them, we have to arrest the whole village. And then that leaves children without fathers. It leaves mothers unable to 
pay rent, pay for school, pay for petrol, etc. So, so they, they just didn't do it. And I mean, when we spoke to the loggers, they, they were really hopeful that one day someone would build a factory in their, near enough to their village that they could just go work at the factory instead of having to go out into the forest and, and log to fuel the factories. Um, I mean, I, in terms of alternatives, whew, yeah, Cambodia is a bit of a mess, so I don't really know where to begin on uh, finding alternatives. I mean, I know there are some attempts at uh, a, a Red Plus project in the area that is claiming to attempt some uh, alternative livelihood operations, but uh, yeah, wouldn't hold out too much hope for that. More questions? Thank you for these amazing presentations. They're an inspiration. I was wondering um, to what extent do we need um, non-profit like funding, etc., and journalism to keep doing the slow journalism that allows for those long investigations that we read from the other side of the world and have impact, etc., or whether how can they be sustainable? You said your family doesn't need your stories. So we, at the same time, risk our lives and learn TikTok? How do we? <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have to start saying that, you know, I'm very privileged to be able to work for um, an organization that's it's non-profit. We have a different module than traditional, traditional newsrooms. So I am privileged enough to have time and resources to chase these type of investigations, right? So we, we spend 10 months, you know, trying to understand how collagen is made and what are the companies involved. So which journalist, ha you know, has this opportunity in traditional newsrooms? We don't. And also we have um, the, you know, we have the support of organizations like the Pulitzer Center who really, you know, backs us and supports our journalism for impact. So first of all, we have to to make this point that, you know, traditional newsrooms, they won't often have um, the same opportunities than we do. Um, but this also opens um, opportunities to think a little bit outside of the box. So we had you know, 10 months to work on the story and to think about how can we deliver this message in a way that people will actually pay attention to? Um, usually, journalists, you know, they have to publish one story after the other and they, they don't find space to innovate. So we are privileged enough to be able to try and experiment and sometimes make mistakes. Um, sometimes it's successful, like this, this example, it's, it's a great one. Um, it was very well received. Um, but I think that it's, it's, you can also try, you know, baby steps. And if you're in a traditional newsrooms, newsroom and you want to try something different, maybe have your, you know, special project on the side, um, maybe try and convince your editor. I know this is like super difficult. And again, I'm speaking from a position of privilege here. Um, but I, I don't know if I answered the question, but it's, I think it's, it's our, it's our, the climate crisis is the most important topic of our generation. We, ha we will have catastrophic consequences if we don't, you know, ring the bell about this. So it's our, it's our duty it's, as journalists, because this is a service, to think on how we can make people care without being sensationalist, um, and also providing some ideas on how to fix um, this mess that we created for ourselves can contribute on, on this answer. Um, I, the project of Lily was a, a big example for us. Like we, we worked together a lot on planning how to publish the story. We knew it was very complex, but we planned together what would be the impact strategy. And I think this is a, a great, um, you know, like a inspiration for other projects of us. Like every time we're gonna publish one of these complex stories, we see this story as the beginning of a process, not the end. Although after 10 months of work, you're like, okay, I published, it's done. It, Sorry, no, it's just the beginning, you know, because then we start doing other things, and that's the model that we're pretty much also following um, at the Pulitzer Centers, that's finding other opportunities for audience engagement. And that can be like a comic book, 
that will be distributed in schools. It's not advocacy. It's really thinking about other formats for your story that will reach different audiences, diverse audiences. So like with doing stories in Congo, you know, like it, it, it is very fair to publish the long form story, but we need to think about radio. We need to think about the comic books. We need to think about the documentary. Jerry's publishing a documentary this week about the stories, right, Jack? So there's like other formats. And that applies not only for rainforests. Uh, uh, we've been working also with ocean reporters, um, you know, like Erin, who's here with me yesterday. It's an a, a ocean fellow. She's doing investigations of one year. So just to say that I, I think we need uh, the non-profits to support this kind of thing. Yeah, I'd just quickly add that without those sort of initiatives that the Pulitzer Center um, has put together and that you know, newsrooms like, like Mongo Bay, like the Bureau, have kind of gotten on board with, I don't know how else we're going to do this. And it doesn't really feel like we have that much time to mess around trying to make profits. So yeah, <laughs> let's just take the money and run. There's time for one more question. Okay, here in the, in the first row. Hello, hi, thank you so much for really interesting investigations. And uh, I'm Angela, I'm a journalist from Serbia. I'm currently in London and I wanted to ask about what would be the key things you would highlight as a need for bigger transparency when it comes to data, if we want to do these kind of stories. Where is data lacking, as obviously both of these investigations relied heavily on data that is not really easy to access. You had to either basically combine it by yourself or rely on other academic research. So what do you think there is, is there a space for us to push more transparency when it comes to, for example, supply chain data, as obviously that's something that's really important for this, to reconstruct where this, I guess, um, anything comes from. I think this is a key point. We need more data and we need companies to be more transparency, mostly. Um, there are some initiatives, some companies are trying to make, make available the information on you know, their suppliers and more information about their operations, but it's definitely not enough. Um, and there's a lot of greenwashing as well. So in these investigations, you have to try and you know, find, your, find your way through all the greenwashing and all the empty statements that companies make. Um, also, um, the backers. We have to look into the financiers of this. Um, so we, can, we should count on regulators, for example, to push companies for more transparency so they can review you know, more information about their operations, about their suppliers. Um, but this depends on governments, and politics is complicated, right? Um, but um, one thing that I, I understood, do, you know, working, working with these type of investigations is that companies really care about the stuff that we publish because there's a reputational risk. So since we cannot fix politics and there's a lot of, you know, impunity and it's complicated to push governments to do their jobs, uh, we can publish stories that will make companies feel embarrassed. Uh, so they will have to act and do something about to clean up their mass. Um, and that was definitely the case with Nestle. So Nestle publishes a list of suppliers um, that's not complete, it's not clear enough. Uh, but it's something, so it's a starting point. And, but we, we have to continue to push them and push banks as well to disclose more information on where the, the money is going. The money, the money is backing destruction and violation of um, um, people's rights around the world. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on as well. Sorry, I spoke too much. Very, very quickly, I would just say, in the absence of data, build your own. Um, that's what we have to do in Cambodia a lot of the time. It's, it's not always possible, it's definitely not easy, and it's certainly not ideal, but it, it helps. Okay, thank you very much to Jerry and Lily. Thank you all for participating, and have a good day. Thank you.